coming up on Mayo Clinic Q&A. Tobacco damages the airways. It damages the substance of the lungs as well and causes emphysema and is the major cause of COPD. Chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or COPD, is a chronic inflammatory lung disease that causes obstructed airflow from the lungs. It's a progressive disease that gets worse over time, but it is treatable. If you catch it at an early phase, if you stop the patient smoking, if you take the patient away from the polluted environment that may be contributing to it, if you treat infections quickly and aggressively, and the patients who have the more severe disease are entered into a rehab program, then the outlook is quite good. Welcome everyone to Mayo Clinic q and I'm Dr. Helena Gazelka. Chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or COPD, is the third leading cause of death worldwide, according to the World Health Organization. COPD is a chronic inflammatory lung disease that causes obstructed airflow from the lungs. The main cause of COPD in developed countries is tobacco smoking. In the developing world, COPD often occurs in people exposed to fumes from burning fuel for cooking or heating in poorly ventilated homes. People with COPD are at increased risk of other diseases too, such as heart disease, lung cancer, and a variety of other conditions. While COPD is a progressive disease, it's also treatable. Um, joining us to discuss this today is Dr. John Costello. Dr. Costello is a consultant pulmonologist at Mayo Clinic Healthcare in London. Welcome, John. Thank you. Glad to be here. Well, I'm so glad to have you here today because you're the first person I've gotten to interview in London. How wonderful. Uh -huh. And John, I suspect, I suspect that it will surprise some of our listeners that there is a Mayo Clinic Healthcare in London. Can you tell us a little about that? Indeed, it's it's a, spl a splendid uh, building in the in in the West End of London. Uh, it's been uh, it's functioning clinically now as an outpatient uh, facility. We have cardiology, we have gastroenterology, and I'm the first uh, pulmonologist here. It's a very exciting initiative in the London scene and uh, has generated an enormous amount of interest. It is wonderful. I had my first visit to London just before COVID in um, 2020. I had to think what year it is. And it was it's an absolutely beautiful facility on a beautiful street. I really enjoyed getting yeah, to see yeah, it. Yeah, it, 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 it is a wonderful facility. Well, John, let's jump in and talk about COPD. What is it and who's at risk of developing it? Right, well, the, the letters COPD, as you say, stand for chronic, so it's a chronic condition, obstructive, implying that there's obstruction to flow of air in and out of the lungs, pulmonary being the lungs disease. And it's an inflammatory condition in the, the airways, the tubes uh, through, through which uh, air is transmitted in and out of the lungs. Um, and because of the inflammation and because of other factors that subsequently happen, the airways narrow and therefore make it more difficult for the patient to breathe. The, air, the airways, because also of the inflammation, produce mucus, and therefore you have a chronic cough. Uh, if, the, uh, if the precipitating factors are not avoided, it does become progressive uh, and ultimately can become very disabling. I think it's a term we have to use very carefully because if our patients consult the internet, about COPD, uh, you see some very gloomy and very frightening things. And the situation isn't always that bad. And indeed, treatment for many aspects of it uh, are available. So uh, it's great for people to consult the internet, but people should also be consulting their physician to filter that information, to give a realistic appraisal of what their situation is. I touched on this just a bit in the intro, but who would be most at risk of developing COPD? Well, it depends, it depends to some extent on where you are in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, in, uh, in developed countries, tobacco, smoking tobacco is one, two, and three. It's, uh, uh, to, tobacco damages the airways. <laughs> it damages the substance of the lungs as well and causes emphysema and is the major cause of COPD and should be, well, it should be avoided at all costs anyway, but certainly in anybody who's developed the condition, if you want to stop the progress of the condition, you must stop smoking. Um, in, the, uh, in the developing world, um, we've come to understand now that there are other factors that may be at play because 
uh, people who do not smoke uh, may be living in very enclosed environments with fires, indoor fires in, in, uh, in, in areas that are not well ventilated. And the inhalation of that smoke um, and, and the, the, the particles and the pollutants uh, will damage their lungs in a very similar way to a smoker. You know, it, it, th that environment, of course, for these people is much more difficult to avoid than the cigarette smoking uh, that we see in, um, in other parts of the world. But they're, they're the two major factors. There are some uh, inherited conditions that lead to a similar syndrome. They are very rare. Um, but uh, people with COPD um, are more uh, at risk from lung, as you said, from lung cancer, from heart disease, coronary artery disease, and indeed at the end stage of the condition from heart failure, right heart failure, because their blood oxygen is so low. It seems that everyone that I interview for this show tells us that smoking is bad. So I guess we can start with that, right? I think we have to start <laughs> with that. We, if we finish with that as well, that would be all right with me. Smoking is poisonous. Uh, it's a it's an unnatural thing to do to inhale voluntarily and inhale smoke into our lungs. It is hugely addictive because of the nicotine content. So you know, I never I try never to lecture patients who smoke because it is tough. It is really tough to give up smoking. Um, the 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 addiction to the nicotine, the nicotine receptors that are open in the brain, crying out for more nicotine. Uh, creates the need. Curiously enough, it's not the nicotine that does the damage in the main, it's the oh. other stuff, the, the, the other um, uh, constituents of cigarette smoke. But the nicotine is what addicts you, and that's so difficult to stop. And there's an old and very bad joke uh, uh, that says, um, oh, I, I've given, it's easy to give up smoking, I've done it many times. And that's, that's a, a, a factor that the people give up and then they relax a little bit and they start again and they do the same time and time again. And of course, every cigarette you smoke does some damage. So the mm. strongest possible advice here is to quit smoking, to avoid smoking, to avoid smoking, smoke in your environment, um, if you can do. From speaking to my patients in the pain clinic who have had to, um, Reverse bad habits. Smoking certainly seems to be one of the things that's most difficult to give up. There is yeah. quite good evidence that it's yeah. as difficult as stopping narcotics. Uh, nicotine oh, wow. is nicotine is hugely addictive, despite claims to the contrary in the past. Um, nicotine is hugely addictive, so we've got to be very sensitive and careful how we handle our patients, and that we don't. We don't do finger wagging or, or lecture. Mm -hmm. it, it's a very tough thing to do, but it's our job um, and our responsibility to give them the best advice and to tell them what the consequences might be if they don't stop. John, do you see much COPD in individuals who've never smoked themselves but been exposed chronically to secondhand smoke? Yes, you do see, see that. It's clearly, it's not as, as severe or as common as those who take in the, the, the smoke directly themselves. But yes, environmental smoke can also, um, can also damage the lungs. And particularly if you have a background of other lung disease, if you're an asthmatic and you live with a smoker, then your airways will become irritated and inflamed by their smoke, um, more so than a normal person living, a non-asthmatic living with a smoker. So if you already have lung disease and you've got a member of your household who smokes, they should be asked to step outside to, to distribute the smoke in the outside air rather than in, in, their, in their home. John, in medicine, we talk a lot about signs and symptoms, signs being things that you and I could observe when we see a patient and symptoms being what the patient describes to us or experiences. What might um, a, an individual who is suffering from COPD experience? Well, one of the definitions of, of, of chronic bronchitis is that you have a cough and sputum for more than three consecutive months and two consecutive years, usually the winter months. Mm -hmm. So recurrent episodes of cough and phlegm uh, is, is a cardinal feature. Over time, then you develop more breathlessness and you will notice that climbing stairs or walking and talking with your partner and um, that you find that more difficult uh, and that that progresses over time until such time as it's seriously interfering with your ability to carry out your normal daily activities. So cough and breathlessness, 
are the major features. As the condition progresses and gets very severe, you may get some ankle swelling um, as there, there, some cardiac involvement manifests itself. It strikes me that those are some of the um, signs and symptoms of other disorders as well. So important to ask your physician and leads it's us It's very to... important to ask your physician. And indeed, yes, I mean, ankle swelling is a good example, which yes. can be caused by many things, um, such as deep venous thrombosis and so on. But, uh, um, but, but uh, with end stage um, COPD, ankle swelling is, is a, a fairly frequent manifestation of right heart failure. John, if an individual comes to see you and they're concerned or you're concerned they might have COPD, how is it diagnosed and why is it sometimes misdiagnosed? Well, the history is critical. Uh, uh, and in, in, uh, in developed countries, clearly the smoking history is a central part of, the, of, the, um, of our attitude to the diagnosis. Uh, the, the history of, of breathlessness and cough um, will we'll give most of it away. It, indeed, in the first few minutes with the patient, uh, the patient is a smoker. The patient comes and says, look, doctor, I've been becoming more and more breathless uh, and I'm, I'm getting these, these frequent chest infections. And they'll often say, if I get a cold, it tends to go down, uh, an upper respiratory infection, it tends to go down on my chest. That's the phrase that's frequently used. Um, so recurrent cough and sputum and progressive breathlessness. Are the, are the symptomatic features. Okay. And how are emphysema and chronic bronchitis? I've heard those terms used for COPD and our listeners might have, are they the same thing? Uh, no, they're not. Uh, chronic bronchitis and emphysema are not the same thing, but they are intimately interlinked. Uh, chronic bronchitis, bronchitis in the bronchi, which are the tubes, is inflammation of the airways. Emphysema is destruction of the architecture of the lung farther down, where the, where the oxygen gets out of the air into the blood and carbon dioxide comes out. So the little, you have the most beautiful structures called alveoli, of which you have 300 million, and they would cover a tennis court if you laid them out. Wow. Uh, it's, a, it's the most wonderful uh, piece of uh, physiology of the, uh, um, in, in gas exchange. Um, but that, that's the part that gets damaged with emphysema. You, these, these uh, little alveoli get destroyed and they get irreversibly destroyed. That's, that's the problem with this. It's destruction of the architecture and the lungs become very floppy and, uh, and the pa patient finds it very difficult in particular to exhale. Um, uh, and emphysema is in the Western world, once again, in, in, in the developed world, uh, is far and away uh, commonest in, uh, in cigarette smokers. But... <clears throat> My advice to patients pre that stage would always be stop smoking earlier. And this, if you have some emphysema, it won't progress. And, and uh, if, if you don't already have emphysema, then it won't happen. John, can you see those, lung, those changes in the lung that you described on imaging studies like chest X-ray or CT scan? Yes, the chest X-ray um, is helpful. It's a time-honored tool of, of our my, my specialty in, in the profession, um, the lungs tend to become a bit overinflated. The patient can become barrel chested because it's easier to get air in than it is to get it out. So you trap air within the lungs and the patients tend to lift their shoulders up and down. So the chest X-ray can show overinflated lungs. It's quite difficult to make a definitive diagnosis of emphysema unless on a chest X-ray, unless there are very large holes called bully. And these do happen in the lung. But far and away, the better way to make the diagnosis structurally uh, is with a CT scan. And the CT scan is a wonderful instrument for showing us the, uh, it's not wonderful for the patient, but it's wonderful, it's very helpful for the doctor for showing us this architectural uh, destruction within the lung. And it's, it's, it's quite definitive. We can also do breathing tests, lung function tests, um, that show that the airflow is obstructed um, and that the gas transfer in the lung is also reduced. And these, these are the, the hallmarks uh, of emphysema. And final point on the lung function, if we give an inhaler a puffer to see if it helps, very often with COPD, as opposed to asthma, very often with COPD, uh, an acute use of an inhaler uh, doesn't help very much. That does not mean to say 
that you don't prescribe inhalers because it it is a, an important part of our treatment. But in the lung fun, in the lung function lab, it may be what looks like irreversible airflow obstruction. Hmm. Um, but we can talk a little bit about treatment later on if you wish. And, and, and where yes, that would be where, great. Can you tell you us in? about what what does it mean when someone has a flare of COPD? I hear that term. And then how do you treat them? Well, the the the, the a flare up of CPD COPD isn't really a flare up of COPD. It's it's it, it is usually an infection in a patient with a COPD lung lungs. Mm. Um, an infection is far and away the commonest um, uh, precipitating factor. So the patient will say, well, I have, I have uh, they'll come into the, to the physician and they will say, well, I've, I've now got increased cough and phlegm. I've made, they may have a fever um, and they may have crackles in their lungs where there weren't any, uh, any, any crackles before. Uh, but but the, the cardinal symptom would be increased cough and sputum. If it's severe, the breathlessness may also be acutely worse, worsened. Mm. <clears throat> One of the very important things to stress with is if the condition is in any way advanced, COPD, the patient has very little reserve. So if you have severe emphysema um, throughout the lungs, and there are various types of emphysema um, in, when we look at it down a microscope, but if you have emphysema throughout the lungs um, and therefore your lung function is severely impaired, if you get an infection on top of that, your reserve in the lungs to cope with that can be quite severely inhibited. And so patients get into trouble quite quickly. So it's important for these patients to be uh, to consult their physician quickly and the, the, for the physician to fit them into their clinic because they can get quite unwell quite quickly. And this is even more important and this has been amplified by the COVID um, mm -hmm. uh, epidemic. So John, does that mean that an individual who gets, you know, we all get upper respiratory infections, I feel like all winter long sometimes. And yeah. does that mean that it's worse for someone who has COPD than it would be for you or for me, perhaps? Because the baseline is different. The, the, the patient mm -hmm. is starting with damaged lungs and therefore will not be able to cope with an infection of any severity. So it's important they get seen more quickly and treated more aggressively. Tell me about treatment. Yeah, treat, treatment... Much, much of what I've described actually sounds quite gloomy because I'm, I'm talking about irreversible airflow obstruction and, and, uh, and advanced disease. Um, but the fact that when you use an inhaler in the laboratory, it doesn't show much change in lung function doesn't mean that the patient who has COPD long term will not benefit from uh, inhaled treatment. So inhaled beta agonists, inhaled bronchodilators that open up the airways can help in more subtle ways within the lung. Uh, by improving vital capacity um, and therefore should be prescribed. And, they, and many patients find them helpful. If the condition is severe, nebulized uh, bronchodilators, the machine you plug in the wall and put in a rather larger dose. And other, uh, other than uh, Ventolin-like drugs, the so-called anticholinergic drugs can also be very helpful in patients with, C with COPD. So inhale treatment is, is very important. Now, there has been a long debate in my specialty about um, whether or not you use inhaled corticosteroids in COPD. Mm -hmm. There's now good evidence that in fact, the inflammation in the lungs has helped. Even though there's a small extra risk of other infections such as pneumonia, but there's good evidence that using a regular inhaled corticosteroid um, will uh, quieten the airway, reduce the cough, and may help the patient's uh, breathlessness. And then what about the use of oxygen, John, when we see people wearing oxygen or using no individuals who use it at night, is that for COPD? It's for, C for COPD amongst other conditions. Um, oxygen is, unless the disease is advanced, oxygen is rarely necessary. And the okay. patient who gets intermittently a little breathless and takes a couple of puffs of oxygen, that's not the right way to use it. When COPD becomes quite advanced and the patient has a chronically low oxygen in the blood when you look at it on the finger pulse oximeter. And if, it's, if the uh, oxygen is persistently low and therefore will be very low at night, giving long-term oxygen treatment is helpful. And that means that the patient uses oxygen overnight and indeed for perhaps for many of their waking hours during the day. Uh, and that will reduce the, the, uh, the incidence of right heart failure because low chronic low blood oxygen affects the right side of the heart. Mm 
and uh, raising the oxygen for as much as we can over a prolonged period of time will, will help to prevent the onset of that. So, but using oxygen on a sort of as required basis uh, may have a placebo effect. And I never, I, I would never criticize the placebo effect because anything that helps our patients helps our patients. But, um, but physiologically is, is probably not of much value. And indeed, some time ago, there was a fashion for marketing oxygen in department stores as a, yes. sort of, uh, a, a fashionable pick me up. And that's completely hopeless because your blood, I can tell from here, and I hope from you from me, I can tell that your blood <laughs> is fully oxygenated and using extra oxygen doesn't get in at all because your blood is 100% saturated. So, but you, using long-term oxygen in, 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 in severe COPD uh, can, can be helpful, but we must be quite careful how we use it. Using oxygen also can have deleterious effects in patients who have what we call CO2 retention. Patients whose lungs are so severely damaged um, that they, they retain carbon dioxide in the blood. And using excessive oxygen with those people can in fact be dangerous. So you must take your physician's advice and, and your specialist physician's advice uh, in how to apply oxygen appropriately. When you said that, it, it reminded me of those oxygen bars that I used to see sometimes in, like you said, department stores, airports, things like that. And I haven't seen those lately, but then I thought I haven't really been no, in any department a few of us stores. Did, a few of us did interviews with the press that I, unfortunately, I think killed off the business. It's of no value. <laughs> but, but, you know, the old placebo effect may be kicking in, but whether That's it's right. like whatever they charge. Right. So what is the life expectancy like for someone who has COPD? Um, if you catch it at an early phase, if you stop the patient smoking, if you take the patient away from the polluted environment that may be contributing to it, um, and you treat it actively. And one, another form of treatment that I haven't mentioned, but, but in terms of prognosis becomes important, is rehabilitation. And um, long-term rehab programs uh, have been very successful uh, in, in centers that specialize in pulmonary disease. So if you apply the uh, use the bronchodilators and the anti-inflammatories, if you treat infections quickly and aggressively, and, you, and the patients who have the more severe disease are entered into a rehab program, then the outlook is quite good. It's impossible to predict in any one individual what the outlook is going to be because it depends on what stage of the condition it's diagnosed uh, and treatment is introduced. Um, this must be an area that is fraught with health disparities, I was thinking, John, because I was thinking about prevention, and I'm sure you're going to say not smoking is probably yes. the best thing that people can do, but there are some people that don't have, That's um, right. that They're, don't and, have opportunity to protect themselves. Indeed, and, and, and in the developing world, keeping yourself warm in winter is an essential that may involve having an indoor fire without ventilation. Uh, it's, it's quite difficult to, to, to advise those people. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, it, avoiding people with infections coming to your home in, in as far as possible, avoiding pollutants. And if you can ventilate, if, if you have a, uh, a fire burning within the dwelling, um, having um, a, as much ventilation as possible um, to, for the smoke to, 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 get, out of the, to get out of the house uh, will be helpful. Well, this has been an absolutely fascinating conversation. Thank you, John, for being here today. It's, it's been very good to talk to you. Thank you for having me. Yes, our pleasure. Our thanks to Dr. John Costello, pulmonologist and consultant at Mayo Clinic Healthcare in London for being with us today. I hope that you learned something. I know that I did. And we wish each of you a very wonderful day. Mayo Clinic Q&A is a production of the Mayo Clinic News Network and is available wherever you get and subscribe to your favorite podcasts. To see a list of all Mayo Clinic podcasts, visit newsnetwork.mayoclinic.org, then click on podcasts. Thanks for listening and be well. We hope you'll offer a review of this and other episodes when the option is available. Comments and questions can also be sent to Mayo Clinic News Network at mayo.edu.